Okay, welcome to the, I'm afraid to say November seminar, so the year's nearly over. So sort of rather worrying, I wonder where it's all gone. Um, it gives me very great pleasure to uh, introduce Aileen Fife, who is newly professorised, if that's the right <coughs> word, at the um, University of St Andrews. She wrote extensively on science and religion in the 19th century and then has moved more recently into a long joy project uh, on publications of the Royal Society of London from the 17th century through to the 21st century and she's going to talk to us about the 20th century. Hey. Thank you Frank. So I hope you all noticed that it was open access week last week. I trust you were all celebrating this in UCL. Yeah. Okay, good. I mean, there's, I, I mention it because there's been a lot of discussion recently of course about academic publishing that we're all participating in or, or hoping to participate in. What about the current state of who owns commercial, who owns academic publishing? Do the commercial companies have too much power and influence? Um, are we allowed to play, put our articles onto SciHub, well onto ResearchGate and are SciHub allowed to carry them? So there's much discussion about the tensions between the commercial interests in academic publishing and the scholarly interests in academic publishing. And so I've been thinking quite a lot about these issues recently because it's a way for me as a historian to bring my knowledge of the history of academic publishing to bear on current day debates. And so for instance earlier this year some of you will know I was lead author on this report which if you haven't read it yet um, and you find me boring later on feel free to download and read it otherwise save it till afterwards. But it's our attempt to untangle the last hundred years or so of what's happen to academic publishing and that means what's happened to it in terms of a business, what's happened to it in terms of a mode of communication, there have for instance been a number of technological changes over the last hundred years, also what's happened to it in terms of the status of research publications in academia, the pressure to publish more, things like research excellence frameworks and so forth. Try and put all those different things together and tell a narrative that was simple enough for policy makers, publishers, librarians and academics from other fields to understand. Uh, so I've been thinking quite a bit about the 20th century in that sense recently, but I've also got wearing my other hat to deal with the 20th century of the Royal Society in terms of the end of the book that I'm writing with my project team. So when I'm doing the kind of more policy related work, the 20th century is the back history to the current debates, whereas actually I've got to finish putting together this somewhat lengthy book about 350 years of academic publishing, particularly about this journal, Philosophical Transactions, it's, depending on how you use your definitions, the world's oldest, the world's longest running scientific journal, and actually probably also the world's longest running periodical of any form. To have 350 years of continuous publication, bar a very little bit, which we're going to skip over for now, is pretty much unheard of. You know, the newspapers, there's no newspapers from this period surviving now. There's no other generalist magazines from the 17th century still surviving. So philosophical transactions is actually a very interesting thing for periodical historians as well as for historians of science. So I have spent the last four and a half years or so of my life, along with some postdocs to help me, looking at this 350 year history. And we're now trying to write it up. And in that context, the 20th century is the end of the story. It's the bit where we've got to work out how to deal with the 20th century. Is it a time you know, are we going to end this story on a high and say, ah, the Royal Society is marvellous and has gone from strength to strength to strength? Or are we going to say, oh, well, you know, it's all been downhill ever since, you know, about 1900, you know, oh dear, sorry. It doesn't work very well rhetorically. You know, how are we going to finish this? And this is something that I'm still wrestling with. So what I want to do today is a little bit of an attempt to sketch out the, the big picture of the 20th century. So I will be looking pretty much over the whole century. There is much more I can say about many of the things that I'll be going past relatively quickly. You're very welcome to ask me about them later on if there are particular things you want to know about. But I'm, what I'm trying to do is look at that, that big picture level rather than detailed case study level. But it's something I found really quite exciting about doing the 350 year project is that it enables us to ask a different type of question from the question that you would ask if you were studying Royal Society publications between the wars. If you're asking a question about 350 years, you can't quite dig into the same level of detail, but you can ask questions about historical change on a completely different scale from what you could normally do. I did my PhD on 10 years worth of a particular publishing company. Now I'm dealing with 350 years. It's a very different feeling and it's very exciting, but also challenging 
And I do feel a little bit nervous standing here talking about the 20th century, because this is actually the bit I feel least confident on, which is why I thought it would be a good idea to talk about it. So um, we'll see how that goes. So I want to start yes, by giving you a little bit of defamiliarization, I guess. Here's a quotation to open with, after all. Historians like evidence. You might want to think about when this comes from, with its concern about attaining the highest possible standards, the importance of high-class refereeing, and the worries about what would happen at the moment that commercial gain began to dominate the field, when the welfare of the scientific community would suffer. There are some fairly <coughs> modern thoughts in there, but I'm sure you won't be surprised to know that it's a little while ago. So this comes from a man who, in the middle of the 20th century, was in the role that you would now call the Chief Executive Officer of the Royal Society, so staff member at the Royal Society, though he did hold a PhD in chemistry and was a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, David Christie Martin. He was giving a lecture at a moment of transition, I think, from one model of scholarly publishing to another. He'd come of age in a world in which scholarly journals were very tightly linked to learned societies. The societies were really key to how research publications worked. Now, I, there were other types of journals, but in terms of the ones that had the detail, the prestige, the length, and the scholarly societies were quite important to those ones. But he's writing now in the 1950s, realizing that things are starting to change. Maybe actually have been changing for a little while. So it's that moment of transition I want to be thinking about. Learned societies were tightly linked to journal publishing for a couple of reasons. One is to do with the fact that for the last couple of centuries, learned societies and national academies for that matter have been a stable organisational form for communities of scholars. So until we get to the expansion of science in the universities in the 19th century, you're looking for some organisational structure that scholars might be part of, and a learned society gives that stability over the long term, which is going to be quite important if you want a journal to keep running over the long term. For instance, lots and lots of journals started off in 18th century Germany. Very few of them ever survived because they didn't have the backing of something like the Academy Royale des Sciences or the Royal Society of London. So there's that structural thing. There's also the fact that learned societies were quite important to the awarding of prestige, credit, reputation, status, however you wish to determine it, through the 17th and 18th century, still in the 19th century. So traditionally, learned society publications convey a certain amount of prestige to those who publish in them. And interestingly, this is true even if the organisation concerned denies that publication means approval, which is the case with the Royal Society, as we'll see. But the other very important reason why learned societies are important to the history of scientific journals is funding, because running a scientific journal for most of history has not been a profitable enterprise, and it has to be subsidised from somewhere, and learned societies and national academies have been a major source of that funding. So for reasons of organisational stability, of prestige and reputation, and of money, the period 17th, 18th, 19th, early 20th century learned societies were utterly critical to the circulation of scientific knowledge. It is going to change, obviously. Um, as Martin himself put it, several <coughs> commercial publishing houses had already realised that there was quite a bit of money to be made in scientific publications, but he was convinced that the societies should be the guardians <coughs> of quality of uh, scientific publications, because that was their chief raison d'etre. He is very much writing at a time of defence for the learned societies. They're seeing a threat coming, from companies like Pergamon Press, Robert Maxwell, and companies that will become part of the Elsevier Empire a little bit later on. And at this moment, this is Martin speaking for the, for the, the learned societies, including the Royal, and saying, no, no, there's an important role here for the learned societies. The commercial companies have different aims, and the two should stay apart. He will change his mind in a little bit. Sorry, that was him again. Now, this isn't, of course, really the moment at which the first threats to the old model arrive. There were stresses and strains on the older learned society model of publishing long before Martin ever wrote. So, for instance, it wasn't post-war that we see the first other sorts of scientific journals coming to compete with the learned societies. The 1790s sees a wave of what are sometimes called commercial journals, journals set up not by societies, not by academics usually, but by publishers who, entrepreneurs, who see a niche in the market and think, ah, maybe there's a niche for a philosophical magazine or for an annals of science. Um, maybe that will work. And some of those work in the long term, some of them don't. Uh, 
By the time we get to the end of the 19th century, there are, of course, more of these types of things. The most famous one would be Nature from 1869, a weekly periodical. At that point in time, you've got to imagine a completely different journal from the nature you know and love or love to hate today. Nature at that point in time was not a research journal in the sense of any of the Royal Society publications. It was a weekly newsletter. It had short, brief news of what was going on in the world of science. It's not somewhere where you'd publish your research. Okay? So it's a very different sort of a thing. The same goes for something like Chemical News, another weekly from the late 19th century. But once we get into the post-war period, which is when you know, Martin is writing, then we've got a whole new range of commercial players moving into scientific publishing, of which Peregrine Press is one of the most obvious. New publishers who've got a new model for how to make a success of this, that I'll come back to later, and who are very, very effective at colonising the many new subfields, subdisciplines that the specialisation of science post-war was throwing up. They did a very good job of providing new journals in those fields. But it wasn't just the external competition that had been changing for a little while. There were also difficulties about this, what I call a gentlemanly or generous tradition of scholarly publishing that the learned societies had been supporting for so long. One is the very simple financial one. As the output of the scientific community kept growing, which was becoming increasingly obvious by the 1890s, and even more obvious by the time we get to the 1930s, let alone the 1960s, more and more stuff is being submitted to the journals and much of it seems publishable. That means publishing more and more stuff. That's got paper, print, ink, distribution costs. And if you're working in a world where you believe that these costs should be supported by a learned society, those costs are getting much bigger. So that's going to put a strain on any learned society's budget. So is it actually possible to continue with this older model? It's been a worry since at least the 1890s. It won't get resolved till the middle of the 20th century. There's also, for the learned society, a possible question about what I've called there the social practices underlying their editorial systems. And I will be saying more about this. But the editorial practices of the learned societies had emerged in a particular social context. The Royal Society, for instance, uh, is a club in the sense that it is closed membership. You get into it by being nominated by an existing member. And there are certain codes of behaviour and sociability that you would follow once you're a member of the club. And yes, I know there's always some radicals in the fringes of any club, but nonetheless, think of it essentially as a closed community. That's kind of maybe okay when most people in, who are interested in the sciences in, let's say, early 19th century Britain all belong to the club. But once we're in the 20th century, let alone even later in the 20th century, it's not true that everybody who's doing scientific research is a fellow of the Royal Society. So the gap between the scientific community at large and the membership of the Royal Society is much bigger in the 20th century than it was before. So there's a number of questions about how sustainable their particular form of editorial practice is. This might make more sense in a few minutes when I explain to you how interesting and unusual <coughs> their editorial system was. But whether that could be sustained in a world where more and more papers were coming in from outsiders, not from members of the club. So there's some issues about whether you can work the system that's worked for the last 150 years can you actually still do it in a new age of expanded international professional science? If I use the word gentlemanly quite a bit, um, I've actually become quite taken with the notion of how long gentlemanly science continues into the 20th century or, and how many of the practices that we still use in academia are still derived from process, practices you might call gentlemanly. And there are obviously there are gendered things to that as well as class and attitudes to money and commerce, among other things. But let us... I'll start by, oh, oh yeah, my two questions. The two, two things I want to talk about today then. One is about how those editorial practices, which were so much created in a particular milieu in the middle of the 19th century, how do they adapt and change in the very different context of the 20th century? And then the financial question, because the Royal Society now makes money from its publications. It didn't uh, in the late 19th century, so there's a question about how we get from one to the other. So you can see that this, these final four or five chapters of the book are going to have a lot of big transformations to deal with. There have been significant transformations earlier in the story, but somehow the 20th century ones seem quite dramatic. They're the ones that explain how we got from this older world to something that actually starts to look like the system of academic publishing we know and use to this day. So I'm going to start <coughs> with the question of editorial practices. And, oops, I don't know why it's doing that, sorry. Here I have to make you realise that the Royal Societies and other learned societies, not just the Royal, learned societies, tended to have quite an unusual form of editorial practice. Because most journals had editors. 
Philosophical Transactions had had an editor when it started, famously Henry Oldenburg. Other journals that from the 19th century had editors who looked after them. There's plenty of examples from the 19th and early 20th century of journals who are, which are colloquially known by their editors' names. So this model also, of course, applies to newspapers, magazines, other periodicals. You generally have an editor in charge of it. Learned society journals generally didn't in the 19th century. There are some exceptions to that. The reason the Royal Society hadn't done from 1752 onwards is because they were worried about what you might call reputational risk. If you have one, char one person in charge of a journal on which your institutional reputation rests. So if a journal has become tightly linked with an institution, which was already the case between philosophical transactions and the Royal Society quite some time before the 1750s, even though they formally and legally weren't actually linked, they seemed to be linked. And you've got no control over that editor who's in charge of this and in charge of your corporate public reputation. And you know, what if that editor is incompetent, biased, or just ill for a prolonged period of time, or you know, decides he's fed up? How do you look after your institutional corporate reputation? And the answer is that you set up some sort of process for collective editorial work. Now, this is the Royal Society's editorial process as it looked in the 20th century. Um, some bits of this have been here since the middle of the 18th century. Other bits were added in the 19th century. So by the time we get to the 20th century, what we've got is a pretty complicated set of processes. It's not you submit your paper by email to the journal editorial staff, they send it to referees and get back to you. We've got several other stages along the way. In particular, we've got the communicator, which is a fellow of the society, and you cannot submit your paper unless you know a fellow of the society, or obviously you are a fellow of the society. So there's a gatekeeping function there. There's then a <coughs> pair of committees in there that you have to get through, all made up of fellows of the society. And there'll be some referees consulted, all of whom were fellows of the society. All these things in slightly paler colour, they're all fellows of the society. So it means that all the editorial functions are devolved on fellows of the society. That's why I mean about the insiders and the club that's going on here. But the other point, other way to put that is there's lots of people involved in this process. It's not one person's decision. This is supposed to be fairer because it means that you know, if one person really doesn't like your work, they're not going to have the ability to stop it getting published. Hopefully the other people involved in the process are going to speak up for you. Hopefully <coughs> bias is going to be sorted out with having so many people involved. Originally they had a committee. That committee there is the oldest part of it. The, these bits here got added in the 19th century. So it's supposed to be um, a more <coughs> fair and safe, reputationally safe way of editing a journal than having an individual editor. So all the learned societies have looked at, and that isn't a huge number, but they all have some variety of committees and referees, and maybe some other bits as well, rather than an individual editor. So at the committees, I say, give you the collective responsibility. Uh, this is technically not the committee of papers, it's a subset of the committee of papers, but I'll just leave you to think about the diversity that's on show and that's we'll be coming back to that. I particularly love this picture because you've got the current officers of the Royal Society underneath the oil paintings of the previous officers of the Society. So it's a kind of nice show of how you know, time, fashions had changed but certain other things hadn't. Anyway, you get collective responsibility out of having committees. With the communicator function, the, the insistence that no paper may be considered by the society, received by the society, unless it's communicated by a fellow or a foreign member who must satisfy himself that it is fit and proper. You've got quite a strong gatekeeping function. Originally, that's essentially a social gatekeeping function to make sure that only suitable people who are likely to be doing the right kind of work get to submit. By the time we're in the early 20th century, there's quite a bit of a debate about whether communicators are actually supposed to be genuinely vetting this before they send it in. You know, is it okay for John to send in all his PhD students or just because just he wants to support them, or does he actually have to read it and decide they're worthy of sending it? You know, question there about the role of the communicator, not totally resolved through, <coughs> through this period. But it keeps out um, proposals for perpe perpetual motion machines, for instance, um, possibly also things like arguments about the link between HIV and AIDS, because there's an interesting case just after the communicator was finally removed in 1990, where you suddenly get uh, some papers about deniers of the link between HIV and AIDS, and you wonder, is it significant that happens just after they've got rid of that gatekeeping function? And the other part of this system that involves the fellows is the referees. The fact that we've got 
somebody with some expertise in the subject who's going to read this paper and consider it. But I've also put up the word, it's not just expertise, but also detailed. Because one of the justifications for having referees when they were set up back in the 1830s wasn't just about expertise. It was also about actually getting someone to read the whole paper. Because prior to that, decisions had been made by the editorial committee on the basis of the secretary's minute of the oral presentation of the paper. So partly refereeing is about expertise, but it's also about actually reading the entire paper and making a decision based on the text rather than just on somebody's memory of the oral paper, or you might, if you wish, the abstract paper. So there's two things going on there with referees. <coughs> so all of those roles, as I've said, are reserved for fellows, and that's going to create some issues as we go into the 20th century. Um, oh yeah, that was just to show you the dates of when this comes in. I mean, this it means you've got a kind of complex system that nobody really goes back to and redesigns from scratch. It's carrying the historical legacy. It's not until 1990 that there's any serious redesign of that system. They just keep kind of adding bits to it, um, rather than kind of thinking, does this actually still work? So there are, again, some issues with that. When we go into the 20th century, we're going to see how that system copes. There's going to be more work to be done, because there's more submissions coming in. There's going to be issues about the status of Royal Society publications, because there's other places you could publish. So why would you choose the Royal Society? And there might be some issues about insiders and outsiders and bias going on there. I'm going to be showing you a certain number of graphs, possibly too many, in which case I apologise, but I'm quite excited by them at the moment. So um, we'll see. Because there's this wonderful paper-based database in the Royal Society. It's a seri sequence called the Register of Papers. It starts in actually the 1850s and it goes right through to 1990. What it records is the title of every paper submitted, the authors, who it was communicated by, if it wasn't by fellows, when it was received, when it was read, when it was referred, to whom it was referred, names of referees, and then when it was voted on, what the decision was, publication. So in other words, you can reconstruct historical acceptance rejection rates, but you can also look at who was refereeing whom, and various interesting things you can do with that. You can also look at the time taken to make decisions, various things that any of you who are involved in journal editorial boards now probably get these in your reports from the, publish, at the you know, annual meeting with your publisher and they present things on how long it took to publish the papers and this kind of stuff. Now, of course, the Royal Society couldn't actually do that kind of number crunching on the paper-based thing, so I've been working with some interns and some computer scientists to turn this into a database that we actually can do some number crunching on. We don't have it all in there yet, but we've got quite a bit of it in there. And so I'll be showing you a whole series of graphs that go from 1865 to 1965, because that's where we have the data for at the moment. So most of the graph, I think all the graphs, well, certainly most of the graphs I'm showing you, 1865 at one end, 1965 at the other just so as you know. <coughs> so the headline trends that we get from looking at this are that there was a growth in submissions to the Royal Society, though I'm going to unpack that in a moment. That growth particularly came from people who were not fellows of the Society, and all of that leads to an editorial system that was somewhat under strain. So there, for instance, is a graph showing total bar is all the submissions and then the colours to tell you what happened to those submissions afterwards. So one thing you see is the number of submissions going up, uh, growing through the late 19th century but definitely growing in the early 20th century. So that's kind of 1900 through 1930. That's the war. So we'll just kind of ignore that as being a special instance. So there's bibliometricians elsewhere in the world who've done studies of global output of scientific research, counting the number of journals, counting the number of journal articles, sort of thing. And this, up to about there, this fits with the wider picture that we have from the growth of scientific publishing in general. Where it gets kind of intriguing is that, um, plateauing post-war rather than growth. Other studies have suggested that post-war is when the big growth really starts. Um, so we go from sort of 2 to 3% growth a year to something like 4 or 5% growth a year. You don't see that at the Royal Society. So one thing that says to me, is that a lot of the post-war growth in scientific publishing was not happening at the Royal Society. And then there's interesting questions one might want to ask about why that might be. Other things you might think of looking at that. Um, oh, actually, I'll just show you. This is, oh, this is one that does have a different x-axis, sorry. But this is the submissions broken down by physical sciences and life sciences. That's the war again. So physical sciences, you see, it's roughly plateauing, possibly even going down towards the end of the 20th century. But look how much bigger physical sciences is than life sciences, which is green. That's quite representative of the Royal Society from the late 19th century through the 20th century. There were many more submissions in 
what they call their A side, physical sciences, physics, chemistry, those kinds of areas. But I do think it's interesting that the green does start going up, especially in the 1970s. One of the things they're constantly worried about through the, the 20th century is the B side, the biological sciences, isn't as strong, they're not as well regarded, and they're not getting as many submissions. But by the time we get to the 1980s, the gap is much smaller than it had been. So there's, again, something to say about that at some point. Let's go back to that one. Something else you'll notice is that the number of rejected papers, those red ones, not very many. They've got a pretty low rejection rate. That is a consequence of the gatekeeping processes, that most of the stuff that wasn't going to be suitable didn't get submitted in the first place. So we're seeing the results after the first triage, effectively. They do still reject a small amount. But remember that rejection is going to be a diplomatically interesting thing to do, because if a committee is going to decide to reject a paper that a fellow of the society has believed is good to go in, then some fellows of the society are overruling another fellow of the society. So throughout the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, the society did not reject papers at all. What they did was strongly hint the paper should be withdrawn. Um, by the time we get to the middle of the 20th century, they've kind of decided to start actually rejecting papers. But you know, again, it shows you the social origins of these processes. Um, something else you might notice is that the green is the philosophical transactions papers, which don't, I don't think, show any particular trend. But the thing I want to draw to your attention is that the growth that we're seeing there is going in the yellow. That's the proceedings. So the secondary journal of the society started in 1831 rather than 1665. It was originally an abstract journal. But by about here, so around about 1900, it's turning into an, a journal of independent research papers. But they're all short papers compared to transaction papers. Transaction papers in the 20th century theoretically have a page limit of 40 pages, plus lots of illustrations. That limit is routinely breached if it's a really good paper and it deserves more pages. Whereas Proceedings has a page limit of 24 pages, which is not breached. And in fact, many <coughs> the, the average paper length is something like I think, 12 to 14 pages for much of this period. So Proceedings papers are shorter. So we're measuring two different things there. That's the long papers, and those are all the shorter papers. Um, but the data doesn't easily allow me to separate those. Some learned societies, when faced with expanding numbers of submissions, decide to set up more journals. So for instance, any of you know anything about, say, the American Chemical Society, or even now the Royal Society of Chemistry, or the Institute of Physics in this country, they all now have a stable of journals. They don't just have one journal or two, they've got lots of them. Um, the American Society in particular has spun off lots and lots and lots of sub-journals to deal with new subfields, to, to provide an outlet for all these papers that are coming in. The Royal Society doesn't do that. Both transactions and proceedings got split into A and B series, A for physical, B for biological. So a sense they've got four journals then through the 20th century. But they never split further than that. There are various discussions about whether there should be a C series for chemistry or possibly for applied science, depending on which decade we're discussing this in. But they don't do it. And you can either say, well, that's kind of behind the times of them, or you can discuss how much it would cost and how difficult it would be to launch all these extra journals. But they don't, they don't do it until, 2000, until the 2000s. They now have 11 journals, so they have now. But it's, it's the 21st century before they expand the number of journals, with the exception of notes and records, of course, which started in 1938. Um, what else would I say about that? All right, let's move on to this one. So all this growth in submissions, it's the blue line I want you to look at, means more refereeing work needing to be done. So we've got number of reports written each year, it's going up. And the reason I've put this other graph underneath is more reports needing written, but through until about the 1960s, the size of the fellowship is not growing. In fact, it's shrinking in that period. It only starts growing post-war. So more stuff coming in, more reports needing written. We don't have more people to write them. So again, this, is this mismatch between the pool of people who do the editorial work, the fellowship, <laughs> and the pool of authors who are submitting, um, which is why there are some strains One of the intriguing things about all this the, is why the Royal Society kept using referees at all. Because there's all this work to be done because they've got committees and they've got referees. Nature didn't have those things. Philosophical Magazine didn't have those things. Plenty of other journals set up by university professors to promote their particular subdiscipline were run by editors. Editor, you know, if, if I'm Professor Michael Foster of the Physiology Society. I am an expert in my field. Why would I need to ask somebody else? I can make my decisions on my own. It'll be so much faster and more efficient. Why use this complex refereeing system? 
because they always have, is, is one answer. But there, by the time we get into the early 20th century, there is a lot of criticism of refereeing as a process from both outside the society and inside the society. It slows things down is one of the most obvious ones. There are some worries about whether it's got um, a conservative bias. There's a famous case from, from as early as the 1890s of the Secretary of the Society finding a paper that had been rejected in 1845. But if it had been published, it would have preempted Clark Maxwell's work. But the referees didn't like him, didn't understand it, so it didn't get published. And Rayleigh, who that Lord Rayleigh, who was the Secretary of the Society at that point in time, says in print that if you're a young man with speculative ideas, it's probably best not to go to one of the learned societies because they won't see the merits of your work. So there are some concerns even then about the conservative bias inbuilt in peer review. And there are worries about whether it's... Um, I see the other ones. One of the complainants was a chemist by the name of Henry Armstrong, who was a relatively senior fellow of the society, who reckons that as early as 1902, he's saying that refereeing is an anachronism. It wastes much valuable time, and although it's supposed to be secret, you know, it, things leak out, and too frequently ill feeling is engendered. You know, and the fact that this is coming from an insider at the society, and all that long ago, if any of you follow the debates nowadays about peer review, is it fit for purpose, is it broken, should we reform peer review? So many of those criticisms have been made long ago. Haven't been resolved, but they're not new criticisms. Um, here we get a, another body also complaining about the delay and injustice caused by these anonymous and <coughs> irresponsible referees. So why on earth would you still do this? I mean, the, the point about delay is basically unarguable. The, by sending a manuscript to referee one, sends it back through the post, then sending it to referee two, who sends it back through the post, We've only got one copy of the physical manuscript at this point in time, bear in mind. So it does take time, even assuming the referee deals with it as soon as they get it. So it does slow things down. And by the time we get into the 1950s, there's, you know, the Royal Society is getting sufficiently worried about this that in the yearbook they have details of how long it takes. So publication in the 1950s was somewhere between 24 weeks and 30 weeks. Whereas um, this is the modern one, they still use this as a key indicator. And they've managed to get down from sorry, 300 days in this case to about 100, just under 100 days. So the current director of publications is very, very proud of that bit there, which went down. But once we get to the 1950s, it's one of the things that the society knows it's being judged on. The other journals are faster than the society journals. But nonetheless, they keep doing this thing with committees and with referees and all the rest of it. Um, there's no evidence, as far as we can tell, of them ever seriously considering dropping it. And in fact, what we actually see during the early 20th century is them starting to use refereeing more. Because in the 19th century, the secondary journal proceedings had a lighter touch system. It didn't actually use referees usually. Whereas by the 1930s and 40s, it generally does use referees. Maybe only one instead of two. But they're going to referees, which slows down the preceding publication times. So at a time when there's this criticism of why are we doing this? Why are we slowing things down with a system that maybe doesn't actually work? They're actually starting to use it more than they had been before. And they're still out of kilter with what's going on in the more commercial publications. And, and will remain so for a while. And it's not just the Royal, it's other learned societies too. Um, so why? Well, there's something here to do about prestige and reputation, because I haven't managed to find any evidence until the post-war period explicitly linking refereeing with quality control. I've got some post-war evidence for it. But even though the Royal Society officially says, and has said since... 1752 all the way through till 1959, uh, the volumes of transactions say that the, the society doesn't pretend to answer for the certainty of the facts or the propriety of reasonings contained in the papers published, which must still rest on the credit or judgment of the respective authors. In other words, they say, we may be publishing this stuff, but we're not endorsing it. This is not a mark of approval. In the 1750s, that was a way of distinguishing yourself from the French. By the 1950s, goodness only knows what it really meant at that point in time. So, but despite that, there is no doubt that people felt that publishing in Royal Society and other Learned Society journals was good for your reputation. That the publications of the Society, says the UCL mathematician Louis Filon, says that they've always been recognised as of exceptionally high standard. So there's something about publishing with, the, with any Learned Society, really, with the processes that you have to go through, that is taken as signifying endorsement in some sense. Probably not in, a, in an epistemological sense. Nobody's going to claim this means it's true. But there is some kind of social endorsement going on there. And it appears to be linked with refereeing. 
And we definitely see that coming out explicitly once we get to the post-war period, when we start getting officials of the society saying things, things like this, where we get, it's the, it's the referees that the society has that help to maintain the standard of British literature, or the quote I gave you earlier from Martin, that the quality of literature is maintained by high-class refereeing. You see that more and more. You know, once you get into the 1990s and you start to get debates about GM food and you get the sense about science, sense about science campaigns, the Royal Society is in there with that discussion about peer review, as it's now called, by the end of the century, is important to the quality and standard of science. Not an argument you'd have seen in the 19th century, but you absolutely see it by the end of the 20th century. So Martin's claims... Uh, I'm going to go through this quickly, actually. Some of you have heard me in peer review before. But Martin's claims about refereeing being something that only the learned societies can do, and that's why learned societies are important, where I've said a defence against the encroaching commercialism of other publishers. He assumed, I think, in the 1950s, that only learned societies could do refereeing, because learned societies had members who would do things for them. By the time we get to the 1960s, certainly the 1970s, companies like Pergamon, like Elsevier, organisations like Nature have all demonstrated that it is perfectly possible for commercial publishers to ask academics to serve on editorial boards, to do refereeing, even without pay, and to do it on the same basis as they would do for the learned societies. It's not something that is a unique property of the learned societies. But the commercial people who have taken it up do also share this belief that it's somehow guaranteeing the quality, the standard of scientific literature. So um, perhaps it was an unfortunate argument for Martin to have made. Um, uh. And with all of that, refereeing no longer being unique to the learned societies, other journals being started up for the new sub-disciplines. The key point here is concerns about whether the Royal Society has <coughs> tended to lose its position in the world in general, but particularly in journal publishing, because there is this tendency now to send letters to nature and publish the details in a specialised society. So in other words, not in the Royal Society, which is a generalist journal, but in one of the specialised societies. So where then? is the role of the Royal Society, which is a, an ongoing question. I want to say a couple of things about the social dynamics of editor, editing, but only relatively briefly. I could give a whole talk about this, but I won't have, won't have time because I want to get finances. There are some good things about having a closed editorial community, because you might share certain beliefs, certain practices, certain ideas about what counts as good science or a well-written paper. So there are adva advantages, but there are also certain disadvantages. <coughs> Uh, this is simply to show you the gender diversity of physicists at the Royal Society. This is pretty much the same as the photo I showed you earlier. So, but there's also a question about numbers and scale. We've been looking particularly at gender recently. Um, got a p paper that's in press at, under review rather at the moment. The take home from this is there were some papers submitted by women to the society. They were possibly growing, but it's not really a very convincing trend. Certainly there were papers submitted by women to the society, the 20th century, at a time when there were no women at all in the fellowship, until 1945, when you get a little blue column there, number of women in the fellowship starting to go up. What this means is that <coughs> women can submit to the society, but they're almost certainly going to be judged and evaluated by men. Now, does that matter? Well, if you've been reading any of the re literature on implicit bias, you might suspect it might matter. Um, it's not something we've got any evidence that the Royal Society ever worried about until very, very recently. Um, we have looked at how many women were actually involved in the refereeing process. You know, once after 1945, there were some women. Maybe they did some editorial work. Well, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for Kathleen Lonsdale, who did almost all of those and almost all of those, there were very few women involved in refereeing work. There were some, but not many. And actually, when you also look at who's doing communicating work and who's sitting on scientific committees, editorial committees, there is an argument to be made that it was actually worse in the 1970s and 80s than it was in the 1950s, which is interesting of itself. So there's more I could say about all of that, but it's just one example of how the lack of diversity might have had some effects on the editorial process, and you know, we've been trying to find examples of that, looking through the referees' reports and so forth. You might expect similar things from internationalism, because by the 60s and 70s we're getting increasing numbers of international authors, but the fellowship, predominantly still British, starts to expand and diversify later. So there might also be international um, implicit biases going on there as well. I think I said earlier, but um, the, you know that growth? I said it's mostly coming from outsiders. That's where I get that from. The huge growth in submissions isn't really a change in submissions from fellows of the society. It's pretty s relatively static. But outsiders grows. And that's, again, that kind of 1900 through 1930 period. So, so early 20th century, the Royal Society seems to be very successful 
in getting lots of people who are not fellow society to submit to its journals, and less so later on. Um, gosh, I'm going to skip some of these. But um, there's more editorial work being done, and more of it is being done on outsiders. I say this again because when these processes were developed in the 19th century, often refereeing was one fellow of the society commenting on another fellow of the society, or perhaps on someone who's about to become fellow of the society. Relatively peer-on-peer-ish. But by the time we've got lots of papers coming in from outsiders, many of whom never become fellows of the society, there's a different relationship going on there about whether this is collegial commenting or whether it is judgment on outsiders. There's also a question about how much investment you as a fellow might have in bothering to read this paper by someone you've never heard of. By the way, it's single blind refereeing, so you can see the name. Um, this paper by someone you've never heard of, and why do you care? Whereas if it's a paper by one of your fellow members of society, or perhaps by one of their friends or students, you might put some effort into doing that. Why would you bother if it's you know, random people from all over the world you've never heard of? So th there are issues there about that balance between the editorial community and the wider author community. One of the things we see is that referees' reports used to run to, well, not all of them, some of them ran to multiple pages of handwritten stuff. It gets codified, formalised, and the comments get shorter as we go on. Um, it becomes less about comment and revision, perhaps more about judgment, arguably. I'm still, just, still considering that one. Or, of course, it might just be the pressure of work. Maybe they didn't have time to write long reports anymore, because we get people like biochemist Neil Adam in, 18, in 1950 saying, for mercy's sake, don't send me any more papers, because they're all rubbish, and it's goodbye to any chance of doing any real work myself. Now, the figures we've got suggest that actually the average load didn't go up all that much. You know, it's something like from an average of 1.5 reports a year to 2.5 reports a year, which doesn't seem that bad. But we've also got figures showing that the variation in workload among referees was what was getting worse, so that a lot of people who did refereeing only did zero or one report a year, and a few people did a lot. Some people were doing eight, nine, ten, fifteen referee reports a year, and I'm, Adam is presumably one of them. So there's a, a skewing of the workload, and the people who are the active referees are feeling really quite overwhelmed. And especially if you remember, they may also be getting requests from the Biochemistry Society, or from Pergamon, or from other places, not just from the Royal Society. You can imagine why you're getting that sense of overload. Um. Now, I'm kind of conscious that I do want to say something about finances, um, but it's actually no bad thing if I haven't quite left myself as much time as I should have had, because I could go on about finances probably far too long. So, what the story about money goes that in the early part of the 20th century, well, that's the late 19th, early 20th century, the red column, which is costs, was bigger than the green column, which is income. So, in other words, the journal's running at a loss. In the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, they pretty much match. So it's just about breaking even. In the end of the 20th century, the green column of income is bigger than the red column, so they're making a surplus. So we've got three phases of finances to explain. I think it's important it's not a simple flipping from making a loss to making a surplus. I also want to make clear that the early phase of this, which is the continuation of the 19th and the 18th century phase, wouldn't have been seen as making a loss because that's not the way the society saw it. Um, Lord Rayleigh is a, a good quote for this, and I've used him before. I mean, he's trying to explain that scientific journals, as far as he's concerned in the 1890s, cannot possibly be money-making things, because there's a very small audience for them. There's not going to be very many people in the world that are going to want to read them. And even though you don't pay the contributors anything, unlike many other journals, you know, the expense of all that mathematical typesetting or those complex engravings and illustrations is so great, you know, really... There aren't that many people in the world who are going to read them. So you, know, you, you can't expect them to be commercially successful. He's slightly disingenuous here, and I think, because really, as Secretary of the Society, would be fully aware that the Society, at that point, had never seriously tried to sell its journals, because it gave them away, mostly. So I'm rather keen on this map, because it shows you play, all the places in the world that got free copies of Royal Society publications in 1908. There's quite a lot of them. It includes pretty much all the universities in the British Isles, for instance, and some of the public libraries. So can you maybe start to see why there weren't very many sales of philosophical transactions? Because they were getting it for free. All the fellows get it for free as well. Because it was a different model. It's a model based on mission. It's a sense that part of the society's role is to circulate knowledge. And the way, one of the ways it does that is by sending its publications out to people across the world. It's not trying to sell them. So to say that it's making a loss in its publications you know, makes sense in our terms, but not necessarily in theirs. However, by the time we're in the early 20th century, 
this is becoming a rather expensive business to produce all these papers and then to send them out rather than selling them. And so this is why really was actually writing to the government because he said it's um, exceeding the spending powers of the society. Societies, all the learned societies. So what, what he's actually doing at this point is appealing to Her Majesty's Treasury for a government grant in support of academic publishing, specifically scientific publishing. And he makes an argument based on the fact that the government has already provided a grant to the Royal Society to administer for scientific research. That's been there since 1849. And so the argument now is that since the government already funds scientific research, the government ought also to fund the publication of that research. Because what's the point of doing the research if you don't also publish it? And it's even better, actually, because you, you'll know where you get, what you're getting value for money, which I rather like as, as a phrase. So what he's appealing for is money for the Royal Society to administer for its own good and for other learned societies. And he's successful. He gets £1,000 no, £1, at that point, and it goes up to £2,500 in the 1920s, and that grant has still been given until it disappears in some financial reorganisations in the 1950s. So getting state support for academic publishing enables that non-commercial model to continue for half a century longer than perhaps it could have done otherwise. And in fact, it's not just government support because the Royal Society also manages to get support from some other private individuals and companies. A chap called Robert Mond, that some of you may have come across, of Mond Brunner, later ICI, they're paying, again, £2,500 in the 1920s to support the publication of physical science and chemistry publications through the Royal Society. So we're looking at the Royal Society subsidising these publications through their own funds, and also the government subsidising it, and a few other people also subsidising it. Um, I'm not going to say much about the war, because actually the war seems to have had remarkably little effect, but there was an emergency finance committee, and they did say we should do something about it, and then not a lot actually happened thereafter. The next big shift comes after the Second World War, when we start to see people like DC Martin talking about the growing commercialisation. And the question then is, you know, firstly, why is it now apparently possible to make money from scientific publications? Why can Robert Maxwell make money? out of scientific journals when learned scientists haven't been managing to do it. There's two key changes here. One is a focus on the international market, particularly the international English-speaking market. In other words, if you're trying to sell not just to British universities, but also to British, Dutch, Australian, Canadian and American universities, and this is the early Cold War when the universities are pretty well funded, including for their library budgets, then actually there's a lot of people you can sell to. And if you're selling to institutional subscribers rather than to individuals, you can charge them more. So you can sell to more people, charge them more money, and you can thus actually manage to make money on your scientific journals. Which is why Pergamon and later, once they caught on, Wiley and Blackwell as well, can launch ever so many new journals through the 60s and early 70s without really worrying about whether it's going to make money, because they're quite sure that they will. This will come to an, an unhappy ending once the economic times change by the late 70s, early 80s, and library budgets are no longer generous, and there's no longer so easy. It's no longer so easy to find markets. But for a while, through the kind of 1950s through to the mid to late 70s, it's a really good time to be a scientific journal publisher, and you can clearly make money on it. So learned societies, of course, have seen this. This is what Martin was talking about in 1957, where he's looking at this, um, which I gave you already. So we'll skip that one. Six years after that, the Royal Society and Martin in particular are, I think, starting to realise that perhaps they can't just say, nah, no place for commerce. They're going to have to admit that perhaps there is a space for commercial publishers in publishing. And so they held a meeting of learned societies in July of 1963 at which they launched a new code of publication for new scientific journals, insisting, uh, given the current debates about open access and scholarly communications licence, I want to look at this, that the editors should be scientific. In other words, journals should be run and managed by academics with credentials, and they should be in charge of editorial and financial policy. In other words, not the commercial publisher, but the academics should be in charge. Copyright should remain with the authors, not be transferred to publishers, um, and get some legal advice as well. So they launched this as a kind of guide to a new future. Okay, we've admitted that the commercial publisher should be in, but there should still be some safeguards for the academic community to ensure that the academics are still in charge of what goes on. Now, what I really would like to know is really whether there's any follow-up from that, because we know this is not really what has happened since. And I haven't yet managed to find anything about really what happened, but there were representatives of 55 learned societies at that meeting. The other thing they discussed at the meeting, which I'm quite keen on, is this booklet 
produced by the Nuffield Foundation called Self Help for Learned Journals, which the I, which I entirely recommend to anyone who's involved with the learned journal nowadays, full of all sorts of useful instruction. It's an attempt to share best practice among learned journal editors at that point in time. Some people at the meeting thought it was um, deeply patronising and weren't impressed by it, leading the president of the Royal Society at the time to deny that we had any responsibility for that. We were just sharing it as a talking point. But nonetheless, DC Martin, the executive secretary, was clearly involved in producing this. It's about trying to explain what's how best to run journals, to share, as I say, best practice, which could be about editorial best practice, it can also be about financial management. But basically it's saying, learned societies, learned journals should buck up and learn from the commercial publishers. Realise that you don't have to sit around moaning about the fact you never make any money on this. If you just reorganise yourself, it is actually possible that you can copy and learn from the commercial publishers. You too can make your journals self-supporting. And by 1963, the Royal Society is in a position to you know, speak from experience. For instance, in 1954, they undertook a massive review of their free and exchange list, and they reckoned they could save about £1,500 a year by basically cutting vast numbers of institutions off that free list. So henceforth, for instance, universities will have to buy their copies. They also um, changed their agreement with Cambridge University Press, who was trying to negotiate more money for dealing with American sales, and the society decided, forget that, we won't, we're still printing with CUP, but actually they were going to take over their own sales and marketing. They said that after an examination of accommodation and the <coughs> staff requirements, it appeared it would be possible for the society to conduct its own sales, uh, provided it could, ac um, could access expert knowledge of sales promotion. And so they do, in 1955, take over their own sales and marketing. And it turns out to be pretty successful, because this is the point at which the publications start breaking even, as you can see. So that's, we go from 1950, slight deficit, to just about breaking even in seven in 1960s. This is not just good for breaking even, it means it frees up all the funds that used to subsidise things, used to subsidise publications. This is a time when, as Peter Collins will know better than I, of course, the Royal Society is starting to think of other things to do with itself, whether we're talking about scientific diplomacy, whether we're talking about policy work or education work, the Royal Society is rethinking its role in the world. And having extra funds that you don't have to use to subsidise publications is kind of useful for that. Um, so that is handy. The final stage of this story comes in the 1970s when there's a big review of Royal Society costs. Um, actually, you can look at that while I talk. But basically there's a review of finances, partly because the 1970s are economically difficult for all sorts of reasons. For the Royal Society specifically, they've just moved premises and the staff costs are going up and up partly because they're hiring more people in sales and marketing, but not, it's not just that. The cost of running the new establishment is also costing a certain amount. And they have a financial review in 1973. Basically, the take-home message of that is it would be really good if publications could make a bit more money, please. Um, you know, I, ideally, um, we need an extra £20,000, and so maybe publications would be a way to get that. And so there's a new sense of trying to get money out of publications. It's the first evidence we've found of an explicit request generate money rather than just breaking even, um, which is um, interesting to those who care about such things. And going back to this map, graph, they succeed. I mean, look at those gaps there. This, you'll notice, isn't necessarily so successful. Um, the profit margins shrink in the 80s and 90s. I think that's, well, I might ask Peter about that one later. My thoughts at the moment are about investment in new technologies, both of computers and tech for typesetting, experiments with early CD-ROMs and early online journals, and a complete reorganisation and overhaul of the journals, including a relaunch of all the journals in 1990. So I think there was a lot of expensive things happening in those years, which I'm guessing is what cuts into those profit margins. And I'm sure you've noticed that gap there, uh, which you can also see. Um, this is the modern commercial director's report to council from 2012, where he's very proud of um, making a surplus of 42% of turnover. Any of you who know anything about academic publishing will recognise that as being about the same level as Elsevier makes, in fact slightly more at that point in time. It's come down marginally since then. So by the early 21st century, publications were very successfully making money for the society, and incidentally so too were conferences and catering and a few other things as well. So that gets us to a situation where by the end of the 20th century, the financial model is totally transformed. The editorial model has also been transformed. I just realised I didn't deal with that on the way through. Because 
By the time we get to the 1960s, they open up refereeing, so <coughs> non-fellows can do refereeing. And by the 1990s, they get rid of the communication role, and so anyone can submit directly. And they revamp, they, they get rid of the various committees and set up journals with editors and editorial boards, much the way that we are now used to. So what this means is that by the end of the 20th century, Royal Society journals operate in a pretty similar way to other journals. They make money in a pretty similar way to other journals. There's no particularly special role for fellows of the Royal Society, except insofar as the editor-in-chief of the journal is a fellow of the Society, except for notes and records, which is the historical one. So this leads me back to the question I started with. How am I going to represent this in the book that I'm supposed to be finishing up? Is it a story of decline and fall, that we had a once great institution that you know, was the leading dominant prestigious publisher of research, and now they're just one journal like every other? Or can I think of something else to say about it than that? I think there's some really interesting questions there about how societies in general should balance money and mission. And I think it's possible that in the coming years, the Royal Society could regain a unique position, something that's distinctive to it, if it were to take a lead on open access and decide to take less money from its publishing. But whether the Royal Society's Council are yet willing to hear that, well, actually, I know they are not currently willing, but there are moves afoot to try and persuade them. Um, but you know, you're left with, is there still a special role for the Royal Society? How do I wrap this up? Um, please feel free to tell me whether either now or over a drink, but I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Aileen. That's sort of fascinating insight into sort of the politics of modern, modern world society in London. Any, um, it's, we've got about half an hour for comments or questions. Peter, would you like to think more? Okay, thank you. Did nobody put their hand up first? <laughs> you know, um, thank you very much. That's, that's lovely. Very rich material um, in all sorts of ways. Um, a couple of comments, I think, or at this stage. How to end your work, uh, I wouldn't presume to tell you, except to point out that the story isn't finished. Mm. And in that sense, you can sort of put dot, dot, dot at the end of your book. You know? We may be doing that, yes. Um, and I think that's, that's a reasonable thing, because you're, you're dealing with, with alive institutions. Yes, indeed. Um, I think I would highlight staff in a particular way, which is that in the 1950s and 60s, you know, staff did what they were told, and, and, and that was all, that was all right. Um, what has changed, you, uh, you, you pointed out earlier that there were four journals for a couple of thousand years, and then suddenly it escalated. What happened was that you got not just sort of brighter staff in, um, but you got much more... Um, professionally experienced staff mm -hmm. and the director of publication you now got from the late 90s onwards you've got the sort of director of publications who thought it was fun to start new journals rather than just do what council mm -hmm. handed down so you've got a much more experienced and uh, capable uh, people mm -hmm. in senior positions and mm -hmm. they expected to be allowed to take initiatives mm -hmm wasn't in the hands of fellows who were basically scientists trying to do other things, but were yeah. more or less interested in publishing. That is, that is a really good point, because you know, I skipped through that one, but it's just to give you a sense of the number of people in the publications department by the 70s. Mm -hmm. Contrast that, in the 19th century, there were no paid staff in publications. The only paid staff society had, apart from the you know, housekeeper and the boilerman and a couple of things, was an assistant secretary who did all the admin for the society. The first publication staff member I can find is 1937. 1937. When when the retiring assistant secretary, Winkworth, Ronald Winkworth, was retiring as assistant secretary and was persuaded to stay on yeah. part-time as an assistant editor. So that was one member of staff in 1937. And now it's something like 123 in the publications department now. And as you uh, see, they, they have a completely different role. They're much more proactive than they were yeah, back then. They're certainly much more proactive. I, I'm not quite sure about that. But, okay. um, the, the, you know, staff, staff changed mm. to being professional and capable mm. people. Um, without denigrating their predecessors. Yeah, I've got to be careful about that yeah. one as well, because some of these people are still alive. Uh, yes, one, you pick your words carefully. Some um, of them have talked to us, and some of them haven't. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, there's also issues like that. A completely different sort of mm. comment um, is the business about free exchange of journals. Mm. Uh, it wasn't just free giving out of filtrons, it was exchange. Ah, but they don't use that phrase at all until the 1950s. Before but it was going on? Yes, but they separate out between a free list and an exchange list. All oh, right. So there, it, that's um, why... Where's that one? That one there. there. There's a distinction, I don't know if you can see the small print, this is from 1954, but oh, by yes. exchanges and by gifts. And what, one of the things they do is they work out, we, send, we receive... £801 worth of stuff in exchange, but we give out £2,300 worth of stuff in exchange. So it's not a balanced exchange, and therefore we should cut some of this. And then there's also the gifts. So yes, I know there, there is something coming back, but there's a lot more going out than is coming back. My point is simply to highlight that the stuff coming back is quite possibly threat rather than opportunity, because the building silts up. And uh -huh. yes, the okay. pressure to stop exchanges were part because we don't want your bloody stuff yes. rather than just handing yes. it out. Help. But a uh, uh, quirky uh, consequence of that is that the Royal Society has quite a strong collection of quite bizarre journals. And if that is of interest to researchers, uh, go and have a look. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I was, I was curious about the fact that you, curious by your examples. They were often about students of members of the society submitting things. Mm -hmm. And then you had the complaint of, I don't want to read, the PhD supervisors should mm. read this stuff yes. before they, they send it to me. Um, as, as kind of representative of an earlier period. And so this was kind of a somewhat, somewhat cynical suggestion of thinking, of course the mission aspect is the presentation and the, the, the way that society presents itself as a mission to science. But I wonder if there's a social function there of accrediting the next generation mm -hmm. of this fairly elitist institution, this club, mm -hmm. and whereby you kind of sending it out is to is part of that accrediting function of sending out to the world and to the broader community. Mm -hmm. This is the new, the, mm -hmm. the coming ones. So it has, and while you go into the sort of more commercial period where what matters is not who's on the page, but the volume of material that you can sell. It's just now become a commodity. And so it's more about volume and margins than anything else. Um, well, that's not true at the site until about the 1980s. But it does but, yeah, but I, was just, I was also um, responding to your yeah. challenge of how do I, mm. what, what kind of color yeah. can I put Impressive. into this? I mean, what they quote I had, well, one of the quotes I had about PhD students, and because um, uh, so Louis Filon in 1936, when he was worrying about the prestige of the society's publications, and he's worried as well that too many PhD supervisors who are fellows are just blindly sending in their PhD students' work without, you know, without choosing the stuff that's really worth it. And he says, you know, 20 or 30 years ago this would never have happened. The second-rate stuff would not have been submitted to the society, but now it is. Well, of course, 20 or 30 years ago there weren't so many PhD students hanging around either. So there, you could read that in two ways. Why was there less of it back then? Was it not sent in, or was just you didn't notice it because it wasn't so much? Um, so they are recognizing that there's a growth in the scientific research community of different types of people who weren't around before. But at least if they're working in the lab of a fellow, then you've got that uh, connection. And yes, I think getting your student into the Royal Society Journal is perhaps one of your duties as a responsible supervisor to try and look after them. There is a lovely quote from the 1970s where they're wondering about getting rid of the communicator function. They say, well, you know, there are something like, there are no doubt many excellent scientists in the world who are not working in the laboratories of fellows of the Royal Society. <laughs> really? You know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, poor them. Maybe they, maybe we need to make a way for them. Because they're at that point now getting worried that perhaps the society is missing out. Because it's got its own networks, it's not seeing all the stuff that's happening outside the networks. And that so, becomes so a worry. So following that, given the database you have, mm. this has become, become a very quickly can become a very empirical question if you draw the networks yeah. of referees and yeah. Um, yes, but it's not on that computer, it's on that screen instead. So yes, we can we can draw the networks and I mean one of the things you see the the ones we've done in the most detail of the late nineteenth century ones haven't fully analysed the twentieth century ones yet. But you see for instance lots of connections between people in physics and chemistry. And you see that there's very few geologists and only a few mathematicians submitting to the society or even connected with the society. 
you can also see the group of people who are in the natural science, sort of the um, natural history sciences, kind of natural history, physiology, comparative anatomy, those kinds of things, and they're all connected to each other. In the 19th century, there are still connections between those two groups. Um, the physical sciences is a much, much bigger group than the, natu the natural history sciences, but there are also cross connections between them. Whereas what I believe we're going to see as we go through to the early 20th century and the mid 20th century networks is that there are going to be far fewer connections between those groups. Um, I can also look at who co-refereed with whom, so I can see, you know, if you know if John and I both referee on a paper together, then that's, that assumes some kind of link between us, at least of expertise, if nothing else. How often do we do that? You know, do I only referee with John once, whereas I referee with Frank much more often? And might that say something about um, the, the power of certain relationships within the society? So we can draw those maps as well. And so, for instance, for the 19th century, um, George Stokes, the physicist, William Thompson, the physicist, and James Clark Maxwell are the three most dominant people in physical science refereeing. Over in the natural history sciences, there's no obvious strong group. There are a few people who are quite active, but no, nothing like there is in physics. So th there are things we can do with that. Trying to work out where to publish any of that and how to write it up is currently a different challenge I'm also facing. Because <laughs> we've got, yes, I've got all this data and, you know, how to crunch it, what to do with it, who's interested in it. Um, sorry, that was... I'm quite excited about all my data at the moment. I want to share. Please. I have a very, very interesting talk, and I especially find, in, find interesting the notion of the communicators as gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. What I found in my dissertation is that some of them, some of them may have used this position. I, I don't know, I just, I'm just guessing that I'm following your, your paper that they may have used this position not to, to promote certain fields of research. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, one of them uh, that I encountered was F.G. Hopkins. <coughs> was really pushing all the papers of the Cambridge Biochemical mm. Institute and he was really, I mean he was also the founder in a sense of biochemistry. So it's, so from from this perspective he was not like a gatekeeper but he was like a, a sponsor kind of or a patron or something, yeah. And I was wondering mm. then if though it was like maybe a common with other uh, maybe other uh, leaders or institute leaders or also fellows of the society and it's interesting okay. that one of the first, I mean, you mentioned uh, like the, the very few women with, that were published, there, but some, quite a few of them came from the Cambridge University, but, and, and he had different approach to mm -hmm. gender, and, and the first mm -hmm. fellow was Marjorie Stephenson, yep. which was one of his disciples. Yeah, but then unfortunately died shortly afterwards, yeah. so it doesn't do very much. Um, well, but the, the, I just the, the backstage, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, crystallography actually is an interesting case yes. for the women, because J.D. Bernal and Lonsdale and Hodgkin are all refereeing each other's papers and uh, and refereeing each other's co-authored papers and there's clearly quite a strong group there. There's the fact that we've got several crystallographers in the early women fellows and then they are actually active, particularly Lonsdale, even Hodgkin to, uh, to an extent as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a quite distinctive group, unlike most of the others. Um, on the communicators, yes, I originally thought that there might be something to say about communicators who are communicating for reasons other than Kind of more straightforward, I think it's a good paper. Maybe because, for instance, if we go back to the 18th century, we know that you could communicate your brother's paper or your son's paper, and you're kind of doing that out of social duty rather than because of anything else. You're vouching for the fact that, um, you know, Erasmus Darwin is sending in his son, uh, uh, Robert, D Robert Waring Darwin's paper, um, and it's, it's the way of getting Robert Darwin started in life and um, to get the credit, hoping to get him into the fellowship. So he's got some letters after his name, and that's that's about social influence. And we were, you know, so I was wondering how often do communicators communicate things that are maybe for family members rather than for, you know, in your actual field? And the disappointing result is not very often as far as we can tell. So it looks like communicators are generally communicating things that are in their research field rather than outside it. And the other thing is that actually very few people do very much communicating. So if you imagine someone like Foster or Hopkins or someone who's in charge of a lab and who's got plenty of PhD students and colleagues passing through, you would have thought they might be quite active sending in lots of papers. Very few people do a lot of communicating. You know, one or two papers a year is actually quite a lot. A lot of people do none. Some do one or two. And then there's a handful do you know, maybe sort of six over a period of 10 years, something like that. Now, I suppose it's because if you communicate the first one and you're successful, they get into the fellowship as well, then you don't need to communicate them anymore. Maybe. Um, we're still looking at that because I was expecting to see you know, kind of laboratory heads being really active in this. I'm not seeing that. At least not in the, we've got data from every five years. Maybe they were doing it on the other numbered years and we haven't looked at them. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> you're sort of implying that the communicators are being proactive. Mm. Is do you have evidence for that? No, um, or only no, because in order to get that, you need to get the kind of personal correspondence yeah. between the author and the communicator. Um, it would only be be episodic yeah. um, evidence, but I mean. I, I, it's at least equally plausible mm -hmm. to assume that they simply do nothing until somebody approaches them and says, look, we need to push this yeah. through. And they uh, say, yeah, okay, do I have to read it? No, yeah. they just push it through. And push it through. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the only yeah. example I can think of right now, and I'm afraid it's not a 20th century one, but of someone who does communicate several times with the same person, is that it's William, William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, right. yeah. who has, a, I can't remember the chap's name, but he was, ends up in Belfast and was in Canada for a while. What? I don't think it's white. Joseph, somebody. Um, he clearly worked with Kelvin in the 1860s in Glasgow, then goes off to Canada, then comes back to Belfast, ends up at Queen's Belfast in a, in a job. Um, but he's, it takes him quite a long time before he gets to be a fellow of the Royal Society. He does eventually. But in that time, Kelvin repeatedly puts papers through for him. Um, most of the other what examples I've got is kind of one off instance of someone communicating them, and that's kind of the end of it. Sadie and then Roland. Um, I realize that I'm the woman asking the question about the women, but you mentioned that you could say a lot more about why there were few active women referees in the 60s and mm. 70s, and I have to take you up. Okay, fine. It's spotty evidence because the numbers are so small, but what we can, if we look at, where's the women? Where's that? Important money. Uh, somewhere where those wind was here. That one. Um, it's, I suppose it's difficult to see on this, but by, you know, here we've got um, two, three female fellows, there we've got ten, by here we've got thirty-three. So, no, here we've got three times as many women available to do stuff. Okay? So we're kind of thinking, hey, excellent, there'll be a few more women that we can see acting as referees. And we were really hoping to find women acting as communicators. We are hoping that you'd see female networks within science, that you'd see somebody like Lonsdale or Hodgkin regularly putting forward other female scientists. And although there is evidence that Ho Hodgkin, no, it's like Lonsdale, I mean in this case, did support women in other areas, there isn't much evidence of her doing that by acting as a communicator to the Royal Society. Whether that's because she wasn't asked, or whether because she didn't suggest, we don't know. Um, but anyway, by the time we get to the 1970s, 1980s, there's more women kicking around. We were hoping to find more of them doing communicating. We found, again, we're doing five-year samples, we found zero in 1975 communicating, one in 1980 and zero in 1985. That's lower numbers than we've got for the 1950s and 60s. And in terms of refereeing, um, I think I gave you the numbers for refereeing again, they're pretty pitiful. So the question then is why? And I, you know, it's speculative, I think, because, well, yeah, it is. One thing is that Quite a lot of those extra women who've been elected to the fellowship in the, by the time we get to the 1970s, to take us up to 33 women, quite a number of them are quite mature by the time they're appointed, even more so than your average male fellow. So actually quite a lot of them are retired by the time they're actually making it into the fellowship. So it's entirely possible they have other things to do with their lives than refereeing papers. One possibility. Um, another possibility is that there are some women who were quite active in Royal Society Affairs in the early and mid 1980s but for instance they end up on council and one of them is a vice president of the society so it's possible that you're, you've got to the stage where the scientists maybe realise we'd better get some women onto council we can maybe even get a woman vice, vice president and so they, they, maybe there's only a small number of women who are actually wanting to be active and they get picked for the high, even higher things and thus they don't do the kind of middle ranking things and the other thing I would say is that the majority of male fellows didn't do much refereeing or communicating either so the fact that most of the women didn't do much refereeing or communicating is entirely normal for a fellow girl society. It's just kind of we were hoping we'd find women doing more stuff. So I think we had a bunch of keen people in the 1950s. I mean, there's a woman on the Publications Committee in 1955, um, Mary Cartwright, mathematician, first woman to serve on the Publications Committee, as far as we can tell. Got Lonsdale doing all this work. Maybe we happen to be fortunate that the early women actually had a few keen individuals, whereas the later women were either so keen that they ended up on council or too busy pursuing their own careers and other things. I mean, you can speculate, I can speculate, John's what's, going what's to speculate. What's the percentage now, just out of interest? 
I don't know because trying to get figures from the Royal Society about the gender of their current referees is... Um, they won't say. Have you asked? Yes, I have asked. The good news is there. if any of you are Royal Society referees, you should have had a survey a couple of weeks ago asking about your gender identity. One of the problems now is that when you're dealing with dead people, you're allowed to go, ah, male, female, male, female. When you're dealing with living people, you're not allowed to do that because I've got to ask you what you identify as and whether you choose a binary gender identity. I wonder if that's an FOI type of quest, actually. So we do have figures for the number of self-identified women or men on editorial boards, um, which I think came out as about 45% women. But referees is different, and it, it's not clear to me whether they don't have the information or whether it's buried in some computer system they can't get it out of. It's, I'm afraid I'm finding it slightly difficult dealing with the diversity team at the Royal Society who are very, very conscious of the way we want to do things now. And are very unwilling to give me information about people's personal gender identity, for instance. Um, whereas I kind of expect if I could just get into the 1990s or the 2000s computer system and actually just have a look, at least I'd, ha I'd have a sense, because I don't know. I really don't know. And I would quite like to know. <laughs> Roland, then Bob, Bill. Uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, really interesting to see that, that long trajectory and the mm -hmm. to the, uh, the whole thing in time. So I, I'm a fist a couple of 19th century questions. So right. It's alright, I know about that as well. Also link through. Um, one thing I, I think I heard you say that Phil Trans was free, whatever that means, um, but in the mid 19th century, it cost 10 quid to be a fellow, and you had to pay an additional 4 quid for Phil Trans. So, what's the trajectory of that change? No. Um, I. I, did, I certainly did not mean to say that Phil Trans was ever free. I, what I did mean to say was that lots of people got it for free. Okay. It is available for sale at a substantial hefty price, which you'll notice is not a fixed price either. One of the other ways in which all these Royal Society journals are different from kind of regular periodicals you might know and love is they don't have a regular periodicity or a fixed price. And that's still true till at least 1977, I think, which, you know, if you're trying, for instance, to set an annual subscription rate so that all your American librarians will sign up, if the, your librarians don't actually know for sure what the subscription is going to be until afterwards when you discover how many pages you've printed, it, it's just very difficult commercially. Um, so, but yes, of course, there, there was a price on Filtrans, and the fellows were getting it for free, yes, except that, of course, they were paying their admission fees and their membership fees. Well, they were paying four quid on top, so simply for Filtrans. No, 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 they weren't. They're, they had their admission fee of about £10. I can't remember when it was at. And then they had their annual fee of £4 or possibly £5, depending when they joined. And it's the annual fee, which is your membership fee, which, yes, oh, gets which you includes Phil, if it includes Phil Trans, but not only that, it is your membership fee. Yeah, okay. um, and the interesting thing about that is that so somewhere or other I had a graph of how the different elements of Royal Society income change over time. And income from fees is not one of the ones that's growing, because by the end of the 19th century, the Society is very conscious that its membership is not mostly aristocratic gentlemen with lots of money to spare anymore. It's somewhat impoverished academics who can barely afford the membership fees and so they don't want to put up the membership fees and in fact they actually start fundraising for a special fund to subsidise member fees for impoverished academics basically um, so they're not getting a lot of income out of that which would have been the obvious way to raise extra money to subsidise the publications but they can't do it well, I was interested in, I think it was your third slide from the end that showed the revenues in the 1990s and 1980s and this was flattening out. Um, which one do you want? That one? Or the more colourful one? That one? No, the one, be the one before it. Yeah. It, interesting that the 90s, it, the 90s was a period of enormous technological change mm. in the printing industry. Mm. And uh, certainly the organisation I was involved in went through a number of iterations about how best to get this message out to the, to the, to the, to the, the outside world. Mm. A lot of them were dead ends. You mentioned CD-ROMs. They were total dead ends. Um, and mainly because nobody got the equipment to read them. Uh, and I think, I wonder if that's why something's worthwhile doing a bit more exploration about, about how the Royal Society approached that, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what made them decide, or at what point they decided to change the technologies, mm -hmm. or whether they just left it for their printers to do it for them. Yeah, quite. Um, so 1990 is a pretty significant date in publications history for the Royal Society because that's when they got rid of the committee of papers that have been there since 1752, gets abolished, communicators get abolished, the journals get given an editor-in-chief and they get individual editorial boards. 
and some new senior publishing people are hired in from outside to come in with commercial experience. The, mo the more senior of those people is someone that we haven't been able to talk to. And it's interesting to note that after he's replaced by somebody else in the mid-2000s, that you go from there, sort of there to there. And so what it looks like to me is if the Royal Scientist Council said, yes, we've got to reorganise things in 1990. We'll bring in these people with expertise, but I'm not sure they got quite the right people. Um, so they seem to have come to CD-ROMs late in the day. Um, and you're yeah, basically too late really to do anything much with them. They, they were involved with Blackwell's Navigator, which was an early online hosting site for various journals. They got involved in that, what, 1996-7, so relatively early on in that, that process. Um, haven't really been able to find out who made first contact or why they got involved in it. Kind of interesting. Before that, the big thing was actually introducing tech. In, into the typesetting process. Mm, wow. um, that actually makes a huge change to the production workflow. So, I mean, it's you, one version of it, you read the 1970s and 80s as being a very exciting time when the publishing staff was professionalising and they were adopting some new technologies, but not necessarily ones you would see as a reader. It's more the kind of back end, um, more editorial production kind of things that they're experimenting with. Um, and yet you see the figures and think, well, actually, actually, I'm not quite sure, so sure what's going on. The actual publishing technologies would be entirely up to CUP at this point in time, but they do take over the typesetting and do that by tech on ultimately in, briefly in India and then back in Britain somewhere. So there are some changes of that nature. I don't have a clear picture of it. And one of the problems with the modern records is they're mostly down a salt mine in Cheshire and not well catalogued. So it's and there's a lot of them, and you know, it's, I keep trying to, well, or my colleague keeps trying to have conversations with people who were there and trying to get a sense of what did you think was going on, and what do you think was the important thing. Um, the change of staff in 1990 was clearly important. Again, the change of staff in 2006 was important. Um, with 2006, bringing in a new senior publisher who's got some experience of academic publishing before, and he's the one who comes and says we should, we should have more journals, we should move take up online more, we can, as far as he's concerned, we can get rid of the print edition entirely. Um, he'd be quite happy to do much more open access stuff, but he was brought in to make money, which he has done as per instruction. So that clearly made a difference. I'm sorry, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer, I'm realising. It's an interesting period in time, yeah. 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 Bill. Great. Um, thanks. I wanted to ask about the rubbish, actually. Um, that is uh, the, the term that was used in, in uh, is it uh, Finon or the mm -hmm. man um, discussing uh, the presumed PhD students' yep. uh, submissions. So in the gentlemanly culture you, you're referring to in yep. the early 20th century, that makes sense to say, well, we won't reject, um, we will kind of ask you to withdraw, and that'll explain those very small numbers of rejections. Um, but still, the numbers, um, as you're showing them in those early graphs, Somewhere, somewhere a bit there. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, but uh, the numbers are still relatively small of uh, yep. rejections. I'm wondering, especially post '73, the post um, the uh, the gatekeeper mm. um, is is there a, a sense of, of, kind of an increase in, in uh, how is there kind of responses yeah. to this, this 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 belief, this acceptance that you can simply reject rather than ask someone to kind of fall on their swords? <laughs> I don't think I've got enough later 20th century data to be sure because right now we're only going up to 65 um, so I don't yet have the later five-year samples which is still working on um, so I'm not sure one of the things about the not rejecting was that if a fellow didn't accept the suggestion that you should withdraw and then complain to council. Council, as the committee papers, were the ultimate arbiter, and remained so through till 1990. But from about 1900 onwards, it didn't usually do anything. So usually the publications went through without council having to have a look, unless there was a difficult case. And so if someone appealed to council, it, the whole thing could drag on for really quite a long time. Which was, and that's why they eventually decided that they needed a, a clearer reject category. Um, no, I don't have any clear evidence that the rejection rate suddenly changed as a consequence of this. I mean, the, the red I had on that bar is all unpublished stuff, not just rejected, but any stuff for any reason wasn't published. 
Um, we do have a little instance from the 1970s when they have a very brief period, three years I think, where they experiment with not having a communicator, that gatekeeper person. Because this is when they're getting worried about whether those those poor people who don't work in a fellow's laboratory and might not be submitting, and particularly people in the colonial um, laboratories. Um, so perhaps we could get rid of that and just allow direct submission to the editorial office. So they try it for a couple of years, and then the report is that it hasn't been worth it. It's generated a lot more trouble and hasn't actually led to many more good papers. So it's at that point seen still as an effective um, triaging system. I mean, one of the things I find intriguing about that as well, though, is that back in the 19th century, you effectively did have a form of direct submission because you could just write to the Secretary of the Royal Society or in an earlier year, the President of the Royal Society and say, would you consider presenting my paper to the Royal Society? And if you ideally were somebody known to them or failing that knew someone who knew them or failing that had an interesting paper that they actually bothered to read and think, yeah, that looks good, then that is a form of direct submission that theoretically goes to an officer of society. The secretaries of the society in the 20th century don't seem to have performed that role. And you know, there's, there's something to say here about the changing role of the secretary of the Royal Society, both of them, during the 20th century. From one thing, they go on to generally five-year terms rather than George Stokes, who was there for 31 years. So they're changing over, and also they're busy academics with other jobs and other things going on. So they have a different sort of relationship to the society than the earlier secretaries did have. Um, so uh, at some point I'll have more data. Well, uh, yeah, um, just thought of this, I was just, just trying to formulate mm. it. I examined a PhD at, at Manchester, I forget the name of the person who wrote it, it was about the, the more general history of the Royal Society mm. uh, in the 20th century. And one thing that was identified one, uh, towards the end of the PhD was, was a, a, an ongoing tension, particularly around scientific diplomacy at the moment, she was focusing on between whether individual FRSs spoke as individuals <laughs> yeah. or as members of the society. And I wonder if there's something going on with this tension that you highlighted between whether the Royal Society endorses um, the knowledge or whether it's the individual authors um, who endorse the knowledge and also the role of the referees. Are they speaking as FRSs uh, on behalf of the society or are they speaking as individual scientists? I think that's got something to do with why we have single blind refereeing there, or particularly why the referees are confidential, rather. Because the referees being, their names being kept confidential, although the reports are, at least in the gist, shared with the authors, but the, name, the identity is confidential. It means they are any FRS, you know, A and other FRS. They are, you know that they're somebody who has some kind of expertise in the field, though if you are from an unusual field, then it might not be that close to you. <laughs> Um, but they, they're, by the anonymity, I think they are representing the fellows in the mass. And I think that that whole complex set of processes that has a lot of fellows involved is not intentionally designed because it evolved, um, but ends up with some form of collective responsibility. And yet there's still that formal denial, but we're vetting this. What, what they would have, they'll go so far as to say that we think it's of interest to our readers and therefore we're putting it out there, is essentially what they'll say. So we're... Um, if they heard of um, technical peer review now, the idea that well, as long as it seems plausible, then we'll publish it, rather than it's got to be plausible and significant and worthy of our journal. So there's a move now to stop worrying about, is it important enough for our journal, and just go, is it actually good science, let's publish it. So you could argue that our society was doing that, but I don't think that's how it was perceived. And actually, if anyone's got any nice snippets for me about examples of people talking about how they perceive the status of the Royal Society, that would be so useful. Because really, I feel I'm working from hearsay at the moment. But it, you get the strong impression that in certain fields in the 20th century, and in many fields in the 19th century, people wanted to be with the Royal Society. They believed it meant something to get through that process, even though apparently it didn't. I'll talk to you about Ding Do Ever Drinks. Okay, one last do question. that. Okay, um, well, thank you for your talk. It's fantastic. And I'm really interested in the Royal Society's distribution and late 19th century. Mm -hmm. I loved your map. I think it was about 1895 of the free copy. Yeah. Talking about uh, the difference between this exchange network. So they are also sending so many copies out for free. Yep, they are. And uh, really, even by late 19th century, there's still that mission to circulate knowledge in a non for profit way. And really, I think the, world's, uh, the government for money is quite a quite subsidized mm. effort. Well, I'm, my question is what if maybe you could talk a bit more about. Um, who are these free copies going to? Do you, what was the um, the print run at, uh, say, 1895? And I'm, I'm sort of guessing it's the who's who of the scientific societies, but what was the criteria for the Yeah, so 
when free copies started, which seems to be back in the 1760s, uh, it couldn't be much earlier than that because the society didn't own the journal before 1752. So after the society takes over the ownership of the journal, that includes the, owner, the ability to do what you will with the spare copies. Um, so early copies go to the King's Library, the Universities of Oxford and Cambridge, and the British Museum. So you know, not entirely unexpected. What you see, early 19th century, it's still only something like 38 institutions on the distribution list. It's 465 by 1908 was the map I gave you. Um, so there's been a big expansion over the 19th century. I've got maps for several points in between, and I'm working on one for the 1930s, but I haven't finished it yet. There's no plan behind who gets these. What happens is that somebody writes in to the council or laterally to the Library and Publications Committee saying, can we have a copy or can we exchange with you? And generally they say yes, except that by the time we're into the 1870s or thereafter, sometimes there's a bit of a check. So for instance, if you are a bona fide educational institution, you'll almost certainly get it. Um, but there might be a check as to if you're coming from some colony, that, you know, some Canadian province that they haven't heard of, or some new American educational institution that they're not quite sure if this is a real university or is this just a secondary college and they're not quite sure, you do occasionally see evidence that somebody's gone off to check and decide. And if it seems like a university level institution, they generally say yes. If it's a learned society, and it's a national level learned society, so a national academy of somewhere, or perhaps a, um, a something else in, that's in the metropolis of its country, chances are they'll say yes. If it's the small town you've never heard of in Cornwall, Natural History Field Club writing in, they're more likely to say no, or perhaps to check whether you have a publication that they'll exchange. So I think, in fact, the one I'm thinking of in Torquay did get to go on the exchange list, whereas somewhere I'd never heard of that's near Wolverhampton that did not get a copy because they were clear, didn't publish anything and didn't seem quite like a proper society in some way, shape or form. So they're starting to do some kind of checks on the scholarly status and the publication as in what we send as in return status. But they send to almost all the universities in these islands and some elsewhere in Europe and in the Dominions. They send to lots of the national academies. They send to museums and observatories and national bureaus of standards, for instance, and to most of the British learned societies of you know, specialist societies for chemistry or for mineralogy or for entomology or whatever it is, and some of the French, German, etc. societies as well. Most of them go to Europe, but in, there are also copies going to Japan and South America and some various other places as well. By the time we're in the early 20th century, there is an interesting choice about whether you give them a free copy of the transactions, which is their heavy, lengthy, cool paper, or whether you send the proceedings, which is smaller and cheaper, and therefore a less valuable return gift. So you can clearly see a pecking order of who gets the transactions and who gets the proceedings. And there's also something interesting that happens once they split into A and B sides. One of the things I think this does is that with the same print run, which is around about 1,000 for most of the time that I'm talking about in the 19th century, for 1,000 for trans, 1,500 for proc. But once you've split into A and B, you've got 1,000 A trans and 1,000 B trans, and not everyone wants both. So with the same theoretical 1,000 copies, you can actually perhaps send them to 2,000 people, because there's not that many people who want both. Um, so they actually managed to cut the print run shortly thereafter down to, I think, 900 after that. But, um, yeah. I, I have an argument going that this is actually an early form of open access, that it's a form of free circulation of academic knowledge, admittedly through institutional libraries. But there's a heck of a lot of free print being distributed. And I think that that's something that is worth pointing out, that this whole desire to make knowledge, knowledge available for free to end users is not new. It's just it was slightly more difficult in the age of print and paper. OK, thank you. Um, I know there are two other hands up, so please do come to the Houseman room where we're going now for a little bit. Uh, so it just remains me to thank Aileen for an absolutely wonderful seminar, and I think everybody's looking forward to her book on, on all of this. Yeah, me too. Uh, and I just have to provide this sort of standard oh. STS goodie bag, which seems to get more and more items in each time. So <laughs> thank you so much.